heard from uh, Prince Carl at all? Yeah. Uh, you know, asking where's the head? How do you get the shortcut to the coffee shop? Um, he haven't trained because he's still on distro list, you know, for stuff that, you know, I could use. So, like you sent me something that they're uh, releasing, the, or they're making turkey. Turkey is no longer a tactical jump combat zone. I guess UCOM decided. So, I mean, it's the kind of thing our, some of our readers care a lot about. So, yeah. um, not the hottest story, but it's, you know, another one's kind of, He's liking it over there. How's he doing? He likes I, think, it. I think he likes it. He's, uh, Hey, he kind of, you know, he's kind of the, the he's EFIS, he's kind of like a writer, he's kind of doing yeah, his really. job for yeah. the State Department. Yeah. I think he's kind of trying to try it out a little bit, and then kind of work from there. Maybe get like a, become like a media officer. Hmm? How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, though. Get that right. snazzy tie you've got on. Yeah. Snazzy tie, yeah. I like that. Thank you. It's getting wild on us. Charlie's Tylus today. Yeah. Charlie's what? Tylus. Tyler's look. It's, yeah. it's kind of a chic thing, I guess. Is that one of the ones you got? That isn't one of the ones. No, it's not one of the Hong Kong yeah. $2 deals. Ah, oh, that would be the thing. Mm -hmm. thing to do. Yeah. Oh, it's a yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Ye
heavy duty. Thank God we're beyond that. We're not far beyond that. government has to respond. And then the government, yeah, I think that's what it is. So this is with the federal judge? Yeah.
I apologize. It's moving day at the Pentagon, so I apologize. It's, uh, it's good afternoon. I first of all want to acknowledge that I think it's today, but we are celebrating the Marine Corps' birthday. And in deference to that, I don't have my normal partner, General Conway, he, who's got a busy day today. And uh, so I thought I'd come out uh, and just take some questions. First, I want to express, obviously, echo the President's condolences to the people of Jordan uh, who have suffered a very serious terrorist attack in the last uh, day or so, and uh, obviously the, the uh, President has spoken on behalf of the United States as to how uh, much we express our condolences to the families involved and to the people of Jordan. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to just uh, move into some questions. Charlie. Um, Larry, does the United States, i.e. the Pentagon and others, have any firm evidence that the Qaris group was responsible for these attacks? It's just too early to know. And, just too early and to doesn't this put the U.S. military under increasing pressure? I mean, in addition to the rising U.S. military death toll in Iraq, under increasing pressure to find this guy, and are you all doing anything to increase those efforts to find him? There, there's a uh, obviously it's it's just too early to to talk about any kind of details, and and the Jordanian government has announced its own uh, investigation into this, and we'll have to see how that investigation unfolds. I can't provide any detailed knowledge at, at the moment. Uh, Zarqawi is a is a is an individual of intense interest. Obviously, in the global war on terror, he is one of the leaders of the Al Qaeda movement, uh, and he is somebody in whom the coalition has great interest in apprehending at some point. And and it's my belief that we will. But at the moment, we have not. Uh, we have captured a number of his associates, and we'll continue to do that. But uh, it, it is a matter of of high import for the coalition. Uh, have there been any interest in? Incidents recently in which you came close to catching him, or you just missed him, or that you know of? We're the coalition, the Iraqi security forces, the U.S. forces are. Uh, I think General Lynch may have provided some indication earlier today to to the press corps out out there in Baghdad uh, has has uh, apprehended quite a number of the leaders of Al Qaeda in in Iraq as well as uh, around the world. 
Uh, getting close isn't good enough, and we know that. Uh, we'll, eventually, Zarqawi will be captured or killed. That's my belief. I think that's the confidence that the uh, coalition has. But at the moment, that hasn't happened. Larry, uh, since the attacks on the hotel, have there been any uh, changes in either limitations on the military, U.S. military uh, movements inside Jordan or relationship with the uh, Jordanian, Jordanian military? And also None to my knowledge. Uh, it's it's uh, our, our military, we have a very small number of military inside Jordan, and we can provide those specific numbers, but it's it's not a very large number. Okay. I was and, wondering and if you did to have my any knowledge, there's been no change in their status. Do you have any specifics? One example is the number of Americans <coughs> military in Jordan. And also, could you sketch out a little bit the, the highlighted uh, aspects of the U.S.-Jordanian military relationship in terms of what you do? regular exercises well it's it's, it's obviously a very important partner in the region the country of Jordan uh, we've uh, Jordan has contributed a field hospital to OIF uh, or OEF I should say and OIF both uh, which which has been much appreciated inside the both Afghanistan and Iraq uh, there's there are some uh, logistics security arrangements that we have with Jordan that, that I, I don't want to go into in any detail but it's the it's the normal things one would expect uh, uh, for a country in that region and it's uh, as I said, we've I think to the best of our understanding now we've our U.S. military are accounted for, and it's a small number. Uh, and we'll provide the specific number. I thought I had it here, but I do not. And I, and I, we'll provide that for you. Do you have any other aspects of like arms sales? Uh, I, I'm not prepared to go into it now. We can we can such as we're able to provide. I'll be happy to try and provide that. For you. Larry, uh, just a couple quick items. Um, Al Qaeda in Iraq. Zarqawi's group has claimed responsibility for the attacks in Jordan. Do you do you believe that? Claim? It's uh, they have made the claim. Apparently, the uh, it is Abu Musab al Zarqawi is Jordanian. We know that uh, his communication or the the attempted communication between uh, Ayman al Zawahiri and um, Zarqawi suggested an interest in using Iraq. Uh, to conduct these kinds of attacks. It is consistent with the kinds of attacks that al-Qaeda has conducted in Iraq and elsewhere. Uh, it is certainly plausible uh, that the claim of al-Qaeda in Iraq is valid, but it, it's, uh, it's just not something that we're able to, to establish yet. Well, assuming that that is the case, does it show that Zarqawi's network <coughs> is, is getting stronger in that it's now able to launch deadly attacks outside Iraq as well as inside? Well, you know, al-Qaeda and Zarqawi has had an interest uh, in, in conducting these kinds of attacks uh, throughout Europe. Uh, Al Zarqawi was active in Europe uh, before the war. So I, it, I, it would be difficult to know whether this reflects uh, some relative strength or not. It's it, The fact is that this is a terrorist organization that has uh, global reach, and we've seen it yet again in Jordan of the kind of devastation that they can do when they choose to attack innocent civilians. Yeah. Larry, Senator McCain said today that the current ideas of a possible drawdown during 2006 are exactly wrong, and I'm just going to read this quote. Instead of drawing down, we should be ramping up with more civil affairs, soldiers, translators, and counterinsurgency operations teams. Our decisions about troop levels should be tied to the success or failure of the mission in Iraq, not to the number of Iraqi troops trained and equipped. You respond to that? Well, I haven't seen Senator McCain's comments, and he's obviously a respected member of the Armed Services Committee, a military man himself. He's got his own judgments, and he, he's certainly entitled to express those judgments. Uh, the judgments that the Secretary of Defense and the President have tended to rely on has been the judgment of our military commanders. And what we've said consistently is somewhat a little bit different than the way you've characterized what Senator McCain said. We've said consistently that it's based on conditions and the, the growing capability of the Iraqi security forces and the evolving handover of responsibility to the Iraqi security forces is just one of the conditions. There are other conditions. The political milestones are being met. Those are important conditions as well. Uh, and, and so there's a, num there's a number of conditions that will have to be assessed over time. It is not tied to a, a timetable. I'm not sure what Senator McCain is referring to with respect to a drawdown in 06 because we, there's been no decision made on that point. And to, uh, uh, the number of forces that we have are the number of forces that General Casey believes that he needs. So um, he has hit on that numerous times about the inability, he says, of U.S. and coalition forces to go in and hold something uh, and, and, and then yeah. not go back and sweep again. It's, uh, it's, it's something that Iraqi security forces are getting better at, at doing. We've, we've seen it in Tal Afar. We're, we're seeing it in the current operation 
where Iraqi security forces are increasingly uh, either leading or co-leading operations, and we've turned over uh, a substantial number of forward operating bases to Iraqi security forces. That will continue. They're developing capability, and uh, but that that by itself won't determine the level of U.S. forces. It'll be based on a number of conditions, including that one. So, but again, I, I haven't seen Senator McCain's comments, so I'm not speaking specifically. Uh, yeah, Jane, Jane. Going, going back to the Zarqawi, Zar, Zarqawi and the Jordanian bombing. Besides the Zawahiri letter, are you seeing any other evidence that Zarqawi's people inside Iraq? are sending people, training people, sending them out to other countries, sending materials out like the I'm not aware of any. So. I'm not aware of anything like that. I mean, what we're seeing to the country is things coming into Iraq that we've talked about from Iran, from elsewhere. Uh, but again, uh, it's, it's, there's, we know what we know about Zarqawi and his network, and there's undoubtedly a lot that we don't know. But what we know for sure is that this is a guy who has uh, that Al Qaeda in general has a vision, and their vision is one of a network capability to f conduct operations around the world, and we've seen them operate uh, elsewhere, uh, including inside the United States. So, uh, I, but with respect to specific relationships between people inside Iraq and out uh, of the type that may have occurred here, n I'm not I'm not aware of anything. One follow up on the uh, strength of the Zarqawi network. Mm -hmm. you, you you said again today, and it's been said repeatedly over the last several months, that uh, the U.S. military, the Iraqi forces, are continuing to roll up uh, key Zarqawi lieutenants. Uh, the statement's been made by some commanders that uh, he has a shrinking uh, uh, number of leaders around him, that uh, that he's is not as strong. Uh, do you still believe that? I mean, fact, I've never said that. I don't know if I said specifically it's not clear whether he's stronger or not. What What is the case is that he, there's a lot of pressure on him and his network inside of Iraq. That's for sure. Uh, he's spending a lot of his time uh, trying to stay alive. That being said, he's still capable of conducting a, a tremendous amount of damage. Inside of Iraq, we saw another attack inside of, in Baghdad today and elsewhere. So it, it's it it would... I would not want to pr describe a trend one way or the other other than to state the facts, and one of the facts we, we're sure of is that we are capturing a lot of al-Qaeda people inside of Iraq. W what we don't know is how many people that exist inside of Iraq that, we, that have yet to be captured, but we're putting a lot of pressure on them. The intelligence is getting better. The Iraqi security forces are increasingly involved in that kind of pressure, and, and the trend is in that direction. But whether or not he, he's more or less capable is just something that we're not going to be able to establish with any certainty. Are you do you still believe, though, that he's in Iraq? Zarqawi? There's no reason to believe otherwise. Anne. Thank you. Rebecca. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> I was thinking of somebody else. I wanted to ask you about confirmation status of um, Secretary Ingle. Almost England, anybody in the department successor. who's up for nomination. Thank you. Uh, Secretary England remains, to the best of my knowledge, today the Secretary of the Navy and the Ac Acting Deputy Secretary of Defense. The uh, um, Secretary Wynne was recently confirmed, as you know, uh, and it's, each of these is, is taken as they come. We're working very closely with the committee and with the leadership of the Senate to get these people confirmed. They are important positions. Uh, in some cases have been uh, left vacant for a very long time. Uh, the Secretary of the Navy job is one that uh, we've got a candidate. He's been voted out. He may, I may not have this most currently, but I think he may have been confirmed by the full Senate. So now we're in a position of having to understand how we uh, manage the fact that Secretary England has not been confirmed as Deputy Secretary of Defense. So it's caused a little bit of a, of a, of a uh, collision of, of positions that we're working through. It's, it's requiring us to be uh, creative in a way that we didn't want to have to be creative. We made nominations. The president nominated these people. Uh, the committee, in most cases, gave them a hearing and reported them out, and there isn't any reason they shouldn't be confirmed at a time of war. But we are dealing with them at each as they come. Why hasn't the president either recess appointed Secretary England or made a bigger push from the Pentagon to get him confirmed? Well, we've had, uh, we've had multiple conversations with the committee leadership about what's the next best thing to do. Uh, and if, it, if the president determines that a recess appointment is appropriate, then the president will make a recess appointment. But at the moment, we're still uh, hopeful that 
Secretary Winter can be confirmed or n not, uh, Secretary Winter can become the Secretary of Navy and Gordon England can become the deputy. I mean, that, that is the desire. It, we, we are operating right now with an Under Secretary of Defense for Policy who's a recess appointee, an Assistant Secretary of Defense for, in the policy shop who's a recess appointee, a vacancy in this position for, um, for over two years. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate. It isn't necessary. These are people, the people that have been nominated are eminently qualified people. Nobody has, a, has addressed their qualifications. It's all got to do with other unrelated issues. And that's unfortunate. It's no way to run a department of this size. But well, that's but unfortunately with the situation we're dealt with. QDR, not to have anybody. Of the QDR? Right. People will be able to evaluate the QDR and, and, and determine how they feel about it when it's completed. It's the Secretary, Secretary England has has uh, done a terrific job kind of leading the working group level. Secretary of Defense is very, very involved in it. The chiefs are involved. I think that's going to be a product that has uh, an awful lot of important uh, thinking in it, and I don't, I, I don't think that this is a related matter. I mean, we've got the right people working on it, but there isn't any reason they shouldn't be confirmed. Yep, back here. Now, on a uh, more mundane matter, the budget, we're coming to the end of the year leading up to the uh, release of the budget in February. Uh, could you give us a feel for the timeline, uh, how things are as far as pull, you know, finally pulling the budget together? Well, tying the QDR we're, we're doing that. our work. The, the uh, QDR is obviously tied to it to the extent that we can make decisions that will affect the 07 budget. We're trying very much to do that. So we're working on a timeline. Some of the trade press has reported on, on nominative timelines that we're working against. But obviously we're in a phase right now where that budget, uh, if the president is going to submit the budget in February, which I think is the current uh, date, uh, when you back that off, the work that we need to do, and then to Office of Management and Budget, we're in that window. So we're we're working very closely through the QDR. There have probably been uh, the senior level review group, which is all the senior leaders, military and civilians in this department, have probably probably met uh, each week, which is saying a lot because that's a very senior group, and they've dedicated an enormous amount of time to resolve ongoing issues in the QDR that can then inform the budget. And that's the phase we're in right now. We're in a very very much. Uh, in a phase where no decisions have been made, but all the issues are, are up on the table. And as a matter of fact, people will be hearing, and I'm sure some of you are, about what the puts and takes are, but just now they're that, puts and takes. There's been no decisions in these areas. So. In normal circumstances, wouldn't, the, wouldn't the, uh, the QDR in large measure be driving future budgets, or certainly play a huge part in them? It's, and well, isn't, yeah. isn't, isn't it, do you worry that the reverse is happening now with the budget cuts? That it, that it might somehow hamstring or curb. There, uh, there's always, I mean, we always QDR. operated in an environment of, of, of resource constraint, uh, but nonetheless, the QDR is intended to be, and the thinking that has been going into it is, tend, is intended not to be constrained by resources, and that's the nature of the thinking. But then once you develop uh, some understanding of, of, of the direction that we want to take in various areas, it then be, goes into a budgetary process, which obviously is a resource process. Uh, exercise as much as anything else. So it's, I think it's working the way it's intended to work. You, you, you work through principles and you work through policies and then you translate it into budgets and that's how it's working. It's, it's been an impressive operation for the people who are involved in terms of the amount of thinking that's gone into very tough issues. I think people when they get the QDR will, will see that a, a lot of very dedicated people spend a, a lot of time thinking through very tough things and it's been a, a rewarding exercise. Uh, another budget question. Uh, General Blum was on the Hill yesterday. Blum? Blum. Okay. National Guard talking about the need for $1.3 billion in emergency funding to help a bunch of things with the Guard, specifically in the context of interoperability and responding to national disasters, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Can you just talk a little bit to what's happening within the, par the department about making sure the Guard gets what it needs? Uh, listen, the Guard is a component of this department, and as we, as we balance the requirements across the department and the, and the capabilities that we want, the Guard will certainly have its opportunity to to lay out, as will the Army and the Air Force, who have responsibility for oversight of the Guard. So it, it, well, the, 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 such resources as are determined to be needed as we balance across risk and capability requirements will be, will be provided to the Guard. Does that seem like a priority, though, what he's talking about? Uh, it's one of many important priorities in this department, sure. Yeah. All right, uh, five more detainees were charged with war crimes. Um, apparently at Guantanamo? At Guantanamo, okay. sorry. Um, uh, apparently, the death the death penalty isn't going to be seeked out for for any of these five, or I guess the original four as well. Can you explain the rationale behind behind that? Um, I guess a couple of them are actually charged with murder. Yeah, I, I think that's just part of the normal process of uh, kind of reviewing review, uh, as the 
uh, pe the people who develop the equivalent of indictments review the charges against them and try and make determinations with the with the uh, uh, prosecutors. Uh, they've made certain um, assessments going in as to the nature of how they want to argue the case, but I, I can't go into the details of why they've determined in each of these cases and indeed whether they actually have. I mean, I've heard discussion along those lines, but I don't know that in all nine cases there's been a, a specific – uh, decision not to pursue the death penalty. I think that there has been. I have heard this. I, the latest five is the one that I'm a little unsure of. The previous four, I was aware that there had been. Yeah. Yeah. And, and well, it's I mean, part of the process. The process allows for that kind of uh, pre-commission uh, assessment and determinations, and that's and the process is working. But isn't this in part bowing to to the to the worries, concerns uh, of overseas members of the coalition who are against the death penalty? I mean, you charge an American soldier in Kuwait. May give him the death penalty for throwing yeah, a grenade and killing people, yeah. and yet, and yet, you have a young Canadian who killed an American. I th soldier. Let me, let me turn it around a little bit, Charlie. I would say that it would be wrong for people to assume that there, that, mil that no military commission will ever seek the death penalty. In these cases, each case is taken as an individual case, and the circumstances of the case are such that they've been able to make determinations in these nine cases. But I, I wouldn't say that uh, – certainly we have coalition partners who have expressed concerns in those areas, but we, we work with our coalition partners. There are, we are aware that there are some concerns about the military commission process, and we've tried to be attentive to those concerns. But each of these cases is kind of established as it comes along, and, and I wouldn't want to make general statements like that. Pretty hard to, if you agree with the Canadians that you're not going to, uh, you're not going to, you know, give Hicks a death penalty, and you agree with the Canadians you're not going to give that young Canadian the death penalty because they're against it. Mm -hmm. Isn't it then pretty hard to 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 just decide that a few well, will get the death penalty? I'm not accepting the premise that it was done because of the concern of the host country. W without question, the host countries in some of those cases have raised those concerns. But as I said, I think that the each case is is established on its own merits, and decisions are made as you go into the commission process. And, and I, as I said, we're aware that some coalition partners have raised some of these concerns. We try and be attentive to those concerns, but I wouldn't make the direct connection. Some may, but I'm just not in a position to be able to do that. So, Is there a worry, though? Sorry, if I could just follow, oh, follow up. Is there sure. also a worry that if any of these detainees would be executed, then you start another, you know, another problem in, in the Middle East of... Just further inflaming our object. The, the military commission process is is uh, a process in, in which has precedent in in U.S. in the United States. It has been effective. Previous military commissions, not in the global war on terror, but in other conflicts, have resulted in the death penalty. The Supreme Court has interested itself in military commissions in our history. They will again in this case, and then we'll follow the procedures of the commission, and it could in some cases lead to the death penalty, in other cases it won't. And our objective is to establish the general fairness of the process and to remind people that the people that are going before military commissions, the United States believes, are, are, are uh, terrorists who have been involved in either planning or p potentially involved in a, a, a terrorist attacks on the United States or its uh, military. So, I mean, these are not... Each of these cases is a difficult case, but these are these are people who are, deserve some measure of process, and the process is what we've established. That process has been scrutinized over the decades, and it, it will receive additional scrutiny, as we all know, because of the current case, the Hamden case, and we'll proceed uh, once those all that determinations are made, and then people will have to draw their own view, conclusions as how they feel about it. So, in the back, and we'll come to Tony. Another question related to the budget. Both of the uh, the uh, appropriations and the defense authorization bills for fiscal 06 are both very late. Uh, is there any willingness to compromise or to concede on the McCain amendment, the anti-torture amendment, in order to get these bills passed? Um, I, I'm. It's those. Are, that's a process that the that the Congress has to determine. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not certain that you could draw the direct line compare uh, uh, correlation between. The McCain amendment and the delay of those bills. I doubt even Senator McCain would draw that connection. Yeah, he's threatened to veto over those over that amendment. Yeah, that's that's one of the issues that's been raised in the state and administration policy. But uh, we'll, you know, the Congress has has a role to play. The president has a role to play in this process, and, and this isn't the first time bills have been late. So I wouldn't it would be. I'm not sure that anybody could say it's precisely because of that reason. There's been a lot of other. There's it's got to do with the congressional calendar and other bills that are of at least. Uh, uh, equal importance in the eyes of the congressional leadership. There's a whole range of reasons why bills are sometimes late. We're operating on a continuing resolution right now, so it's not the only uh, appropriations bill that's late. So. 
Yeah, Alan. After his meeting with Secretary Rumsfeld, the Israeli Defense Minister was quoted as saying that uh, they're back to normal uh, technology exchange with regard to the Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, can you say if that's true? And if so, what did the Israelis do to achieve that? If it's not true, what's missing? Well, I think we did a readout when we had an agreement uh, back when. I'm getting a head nod from yeah, Tony. It's that a readout with no information, though. Especially okay, that's the kind we prefer. <laughs> <laughs> But that was the previous agreement. We, we have reached agreements with the Israeli government with respect to technology transfer. The, the Israeli government may, made uh, some decisions to do things differently in order to, to satisfy the concerns that we raised, that they accepted and agreed with. Uh, and as a result, we, we do, I do think that we're, we have re reached, uh, and Brian can correct me on this after the fact, but I mean, I, we did reach an agreement s some months ago. And, and subsequent to that, there was some discussion about it at the meeting with Minister Mofaz last week. Uh, the, the agreement was that, that Israel w had to do certain things. The question is whether they've done them and whether the uh, lack of comfort level or restrictions that are on the uh, exchange of information about technology have been removed. I'll tell you what, let me try and get a little bit more detail for you. To the best of my recollection, we did a little bit of a readout after the agreement was reached, and then there was some discussion about it when Minister Mofas was here last week. Uh, and as far as I know, we are moving forward again in a, an environment where some changes have been made to the way that the Israeli government handles this, this information. And the United States has satisfied itself that those are appropriate changes to the way that the Israeli government operates. So, a couple uh, other budget questions on the QDR. As I mentioned in the budget today. To what extent will the QDR's recommendations play in the 07 budget versus the 08 and beyond? To the extent that we can make dis reasonable decisions that are defensible decisions that can be documented, and uh, that's in, in that's probably going to be in a lot of areas. I mean, it, there's a lot of things uh, uh, across the range of activities of this department where we think we've made we've we've been able to learn uh, with sufficient sufficient conviction about some things that can affect the 07 program, and so as a result, we'll try and include that in the 07 recommendations to OMB. You'll, you'll try to include, but the, the bulk of the recommendations is at first it will impact the 08. Well, the nature of the QDR is such that some of them are, are broad policy decisions that require further analysis, further work. It might be a, a slight alteration in direction of a, of a, of a policy. So it would be hard to say, to parse out that some portion, some percentage of the decisions are going to be affected in 07 and the others beyond. I think it's a, little, it's, it's a lot of both. There will be a lot of direct impacts on the 07 program, and that's what is obviously the priority to work through now. Remember, we'll finish that up now, but the QDR doesn't go up till February, so there'll still be work on the QDR right up till the end. Follow up on Gordon England's memo last week mm -hmm. directing $32 billion of adjustments. Can you put October 21st memo, that one? Whenever it was, yeah, yeah, a couple weeks ago. Can you I give some it. context there in terms of where do $32 billion of shortages come from in a building that's gotten a lot, boatloads of money over the last couple well, of years? Well, and that, that remains to be seen. I mean, I think what, what, uh, what this, the, the intent of the, of, of, of the deputy's memo was is to help, is to give people a clear understanding of how they need to prioritize as we get close to the end of developing the 07 program. So I don't think it's a question of shortage as much as tell us where the real priorities are. If, the, if, if we're going to have to find some percentage of the total, this, then it's time to really start laying out what are the priorities, what things can be, must be done now, what might be deferred, how do you maybe stretch a program out, and that's the work that's going on right now. But there is, with, but you said it correctly. This department has had, I think, between underlying budget and supplementals, an increase in some 40 percent since 2001. I mean, the, the, the president and the Congress's commitment to national defense and the programs and priorities of this department have been uh, quite substantial. You know, the Army's gotten $160 billion in FY05, and yet they have like a $2.3 billion shortage in 07. Mm -hmm. It boggles the line where you get a shortage when you've got that kind of money. Yeah, the Army is a very busy service, and so they're going to have to sort that through. As you know, the Army has grown a bit. Their end strength now is over 600000 when you add activated reserves to that. Uh, and the Army is a very busy force right now. So uh, I think between underlying budget and supplementals, the Army will, will, I think, do its best to meet that, the target that the deputy set out. That was not a direct, England's memo was not a directive to cut 32 No, it was weapons. not. It was it's not. It, it was certainly not intended to be that, as I understood it. And, and, Brian, if you had a different interpretation, it was not intended to be that. It was intended to be what I described, which is give us a priority that can tally up to that amount if this is a, if this is a figure that we have to account for. 
So. Well, where will a lot of the cuts be made then? I mean, you, you have In many like cases, we're not talking about cuts. We're talking about redu reductions in planned increases. And so let's be very clear about that. We're, uh, there may indeed be cuts, but I think it's important. A cut in Washington, as you all know, is really a reduction in a planned increase. And, and in many cases, that's what we're talking about. If, if, if we were going to spend $100 billion, it might end up being we're only going to spend $97 billion more than we were on another, you know, that's not exactly a cut. Not, the average American would not see that as a cut. So that's, I think it's, I know that we don't think we're talking to average Americans, but they think they're talking to us sometimes, so. Jim. Yeah, is, is there gonna be any change in the, uh, uh, the date uh, for the military commission on Hicks? To be determined. That we're, there's, there's, uh, there's a discussion going on about that now. What is the way, best way to manage through the Supreme Court's decision to review the Hamden case. And, you mean and so. aside from aside from replying to the request from Hicks's attorney, you mean you may just decide we'll not to do it? Yeah, I mean we'll see. We'll see. I mean there, there's procedural ways it could be done. There's policy decisions that can be made to just suspend. I mean I don't want to I, I don't want to indicate because I I don't know how it's going to come out. But there's the people that uh, are responsible for overseeing this process will make a determination as to the best way to respond to the court's interest in this case. I guess what I mean is you all could just decide. It's not. It's, it it's as, a decision that's going to be made after interagency discussion because it's not a decision that solely affects the Department of Defense. So there is interagency discussion going on there now. Do you know when Maybe take one or two. Do you know when we're going to get a decision on that? Well, but as I recall, I think the case was supposed to begin on November 18th, and I think, as I understand, although I don't know this for sure, the the uh, his attorney has filed, and there's and the judge has imposed some time frame. After, in, within which he would like to see a response. So we're, we're trying to, I think the policy makers that worry about this are thinking through how do we best be responsive to the court, which we know we have to be, but adopt the right policy. And it just, it, it's all going to be resolved soon enough because November 18th is next week. So. Can I ask you to clarify the detainee guidelines, uh, the document that came out the other day? Excuse Interrogation? Me, if you, excuse me if this has been asked. But there is a it's paragraph. Okay. No, there's a paragraph in it that implies the secretary could give wit written exemptions to standard or right. main practices. Some news organizations claim this is a big loophole. Uh, it's pretty standard is. language in most direction, directives of the department that, uh, you know, it, it, by the way, a lot of statutes are written this way too, where a statute is the law unless waived by the president. Or, you know, it's not uncommon. There was that was not provided in there with anything in mind. It's fairly standard language in Department of Defense instructions or directives that there be a waiver authority for whatever purposes may be a waiver may be needed. There was no intent, and there's no preconceived notion that that that's desirable. It's just it's fairly standard. Approach. Dirk may get more experience with you. You know, the secretary, you remember, revised, approved harsh measures, then he pulled it back, and then there was questions about Well, I would say that that directive was written, as are some other directives. We're going to have one soon on detainee policy generally. We'll have one soon on medical policy for detainees. That reflects a lot of lessons learned. We, we've learned a lot of lessons. We've published a lot of results of investigations, and, and I, I would think you'd expect that we would have learned things, and as a result, changed the way we operate to the extent that it needs to be changed. And, and so these directives that you're going to start seeing over the coming weeks reflect that. They reflect that we learn things. And I, and I wouldn't connect that clause to having learned anything particular. I would say, as I said, that's a fairly standard, you'll find that in a lot of Department of Defense directives. It just ultimately the Department of Defense by statute, the Secretary of Defense is responsible for the authority direction control of the Department of Defense. And that's just a reflection of that authority that he is given in statute. So. Any other questions? All righty. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Have a happy Veterans Day for those of you, the veterans among us. No, uh, Thanksgiving probably. Is SecDef going, uh, going to Australia next week. Couldn't get any of you guys to go along with them, unfortunately. You go? Yeah. Are you really? Plan to. What's on the agenda there? You come, you can find out. Any guys can keep up with this.